open it up with me to the book of 1 John. We'll be in chapter 1 and 2. If you don't know where 1 John is, it's in the back of your Bible. If you hit Revelation and start working that way, you'll get there quicker than if you start in Genesis. So you're going to make your way back there today. Um, I, I want to share with you a, a few things that are going on in my world. Uh, as we get back to the normal, my new normal every year starts off um, with a two-week study break. Uh, and for the next two weeks, I will be uh, out of the office. If you email me or, or call, it will be forwarded to someone who can totally take care of you and minister to you and answer your questions. Uh, it's a time where I get away from my family and my friends and the church, even all that God has given me to hold dear to my heart. And I really just go up on my mountain, so to speak, and spend time with the Lord. And uh, this year, as he's sitting here thinking about it today, um, I'm, I'm going to go within driving distance of Washington, D.C., and just feel compelled that I just need to prayer walk around that place. Um, and, and it's just been on my heart, and all of a sudden the Lord just starts bringing it together. Um, I've just been compelled by by a feeling. This is not gospel, so if you disagree with me, it's okay. This is not part of from the sermon. Um, there just seems like there's a lack of maturity coming through our leadership right now, uh, all the way across the board, from from the vulgarity of of talk to the uh, unkindness that we have towards. It's just amazing, and. And no kidding, here I am sitting here praying and, and singing, and I'm thinking, Lord, I, I hope that's not happening in our church. Because we talk about being disciples who make disciples. One of the things that we desire wholeheartedly, individually as a staff, but also for our church, is that we don't lack spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is not something that we have, and once we accomplish it, we're good. Right? Spiritual maturity is a, is a way of, of life that God calls us to continual maturity in Him. And if we stop seeking the Lord, if we stop being disciples who are maturing, then, then we actually regress. And that same maturity that we had starts working against us just a little bit. I was thinking about that um, as I was going through, not the spiritual side, but just about uh, who I am and what God wants for me for the year as I'm to grow. And Christy and I were in Walmart picking up a couple of TVs to finish getting everything ready for the life group. And I don't know if you ever bought a TV, but it has that like buckle on it. It's like a super strap. We need this for our, for our children, right? It's, you put these on and it sucks in tight. And if they go out of sight, it alarms go off everywhere. They're amazing. And so we're buying a couple of TVs, and these need to be taken off. And the young man that was helping, um, I, I said, do you need to take these off? And he said, you know, I can't. Um, he had a condition that allowed his hands not to, to work correctly. And so we started talking a little bit. And, and I said, well, can I, can I help you? And uh, he pretended like I didn't say that. Against the, it's against the law or something. I don't know. So, so I said, okay. He said, no, we need to wait for someone. And y'all, if you know me, I'm like, Wait. Are you kidding? I have somewhere to be. I don't know where it is, but it can't wait. And so then his supervisor walks near, and she's got her arm in a sling. And he's like, so, you know, he said her name. Could you come over and help out? She's like, what do you need? He's like, well, I need to take this off. And I'm like, can I help? And again, she pretended like I didn't say that. So I now think it's a policy, which is nice and so we lay the, the, the box down, and, and she pulls her arm out of the sling and, and goes to work. I, so we get this, I said, I don't think that sling's doing any good for you. And, and she says, well, no, I, I, cut, I cut my hand. <laughs> this will, you'll love this. I cut my hand, and I'm keeping this sling so that blood won't rush to it. And I said, that's, that's brilliant. And she just looks like she'd had a hard time. And then all of a sudden, not in my normal mind, I say, and then people in line, can I just pray for you? <laughs> Which is really weird. And, and, and she looks at me and she goes, sure. I think I'm wearing my first Baptist hat. Like, it, I wear that to say I'm not that weird, you know. And, um, <laughs> and so then Christy's right there with me. I don't know what she was thinking. I said, can we hold hands and pray over you? All of a sudden, you're remembering back. Pastor David, don't give strangers hugs and don't hold their hands, right? And so she says, sure. Remember where the cut was? I don't even think. And so we pray in front of everybody. 
And when she's done, when we're done, she said, I really needed to stop and pray. Thanks for taking a minute. And I walked away, and it wasn't until I walked away till I realized how weird I just was. Because if I would have caught, thought through and cognitively thought about all the repercussions of what everybody in the world might be thinking, of whether people would be pleased or not pleased, or happy or not happy, I'm telling you, there's no way in the world that I'm doing that. I'm probably just saying, hey, listen, I go to First Baptist, and just, I want you to know I'm praying for you today, and walk away. Like, that, that's the, like, easy prayer route, right? I'm praying for you, and I'm, I'm going to do it right now as I walk away, so I don't forget kind of thing. But praise God, just in that moment, he allowed me to be mature enough to be mindful of what really mattered. And, and I, I want to let you know, that's, that's not something I take for granted. There's no spiritual marker that says, when you grow up, you can be like me and be mindful of God without knowing it too. That's not it. The reality is that God has called us to really being alive. And, and my desire for me and my desire for you in 2019 is that we really live. That we be mindful of what matters most and that we unintentionally neglect the things that don't matter. The noise. And, and, and that noise may come from the person sitting next from you in the pew. It may come from the person who lives in your house with you. It may come from the person that's standing in line waiting on Walmart while this crazy preacher dude is praying with this lady. My, my prayer is, is that you and I really live this year. I, I think that's, that's a desire of most of us every January 1st through 10th, Right? Every January 1st through 10th, we have this desire for this year to be better, to really live. And so we make a New Year's what? Resolution. Have you made one yet? Like you didn't tell anybody because you don't do that. But like if God opened up your heart, you've got these eight things right here that you want to do. Let me tell you, a resolution is simply starting a goal. It, it, it creates a psychological mind shift, and there's nothing wrong with it. At the core of the word uh, resolution is this idea of, I just want to be better. And, and church, in, in every area of our life, it's okay to have a desire to be better. Here's, here's the difference between a normal resolution and when it comes to in spirit. First of all, a resolution works to be better until you have victory. Amen? I mean, I want you to think about this because there's two sides of our spiritual walk, and we, we have to understand how better works in Jesus. If you have a resolution to lose 10 pounds this year, let's say, not that anyone in here needs it. That is, I'm not looking at you or you or you either. And let's say you do that, and you say, oh, I made my resolution. What are you going to do next year? Next year's 10 pounds, too. If every time you taste victory, you pretend like you didn't taste victory, what happens in 30 years? You may have died 10 years ago. If you lose 10 pounds a year, and you never stop losing 10 pounds because you never are living in victory, it eventually causes death. Isn't that a weird idea? That when we have been victorious and we live a victorious world, a victorious life, unvictoriously, it's living death. You ever thought about that, how it works with your spirit? That's what we're going to be talking about. If you want the whole sermon in a nutshell, it's going to be the first point last, and we'll say it again at the end. You and I, in Christ, can have, or do have, if you have a relationship with Him, victory in your life. But most of us are living unvictorious lives because we are not resolved to live in the victory that Christ has given us. So we make responses and actions to bring victory when victory is already won, which causes death in our spirit. This is what John talks about in 1 John. This, this, this idea. Look with me in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. This is where we're going. The Bible says this. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. 
If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, there's intentionality there, church. We lie. We do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of sin. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, to, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. There are about 75 different lessons in this passage of Scripture. So if the Lord gives you one of them while I'm talking, you chase him. But here's what I want you to know when it replies to living victoriously. A victorious life is only possible because God is perfect. That, that's why a victorious life is possible. And, and on that note, it is his perfection which, pro, which provides the basis for true fellowship with him and with others. There, there's the secret to understanding how to live life in a victorious way. If you and I get nothing else crystal clear, it's that you and I, living in victory, are supposed to be better and better and better. Not because of our actions, we'll get there. But that God has no more better to be. Because he's perfect. Church, right now, you need to hear this. I just In your heart, I know this. Your victorious life is not based on you or someone else being perfect or better. And we hide behind everybody else's flaws or our own all day long. And this morning, you need to hear this. Your victory is based on God's perfection. Now, this is, this is crazy. The Bible says here at the very beginning in verse 5, verse 1, or excuse me, verse 5, chapter 1, it says, this is the message we heard him proclaim, that God is light and there is no darkness in him. This idea of light is perfection. From the Old Testament, the, the Moses comes and he counters God in the burning bush, the light, to the psalmist saying that the Lord covers himself with light as a garment. It shows us that God has been perfect from the beginning. He is perfect today, and he will be perfect forevermore. There's no growth needed. There's no lessons learned. There's nothing that he needs. And here's the beauty of it. The victory that he offers us is based on his perfection, not on how perfect you can be or someone else can be. That's a lie we tell ourselves to escape when we're living unvictoriously in victory. The Bible says that, that God is light. And church, there's not one person in this room nor one person that has ever been perfect, without flaw, without stain, without blemish outside of our triune God. His perfection starts to, to work its way down when he says, God is light, and in him there's no darkness. It says in verse, verse 7, a little bit further down, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. In other words, his perfection works. I mean, check this out. Fellowship with one another and with God is based on who? This is an easy one. Ready? One, two, three. God. Right? That's it. This is the churchiest answer you'll ever find. If you are out of fellowship with someone else, here's a clue. Then you're out of fellowship with the Lord. If, if you want fellowship with others, then you'll find it in God. We don't make things right here before we make things right here. Paul says it this way to the Corinthian church. Death, where is your victory? It's not where it should be because the perfection of God invades it. Why? Because God's perfection works. 
If you look back to David and his Psalms, he says, Lord, where can I go from your spirit? To the heights, to the depths, you're there. Why? Because there's no place that God's perfection won't find you, won't be there for you. He would go on a little bit further in, in Isaiah, and they would say, woe to those who say the Lord can't see us. Guess what? His perfection makes sure that he can. And while we were yet sinners, his perfection worked for us in Jesus Christ. This is radical. This is a change. If you look around all the religions of the world, including some of the, the new, exciting, extremely weird ones, anytime there's one deity, a monotheistic deity, the perfection of that deity is why you and I should be uncomfortable. It's why we can have no safety. Now, outside of, of Christ, outside of Christianity, the perfection of that deity is the condemnation for you. And so if you just be better and better and better and better, you might appease that deity. There's a reason that's a living hell. You see, what the Bible says is that's completely false. It is the perfection of of the Lord that provides the relationship, the basis for fellowship between one another and him. In other words, his perfection isn't condemning, it's inviting. This is a pretty amazing idea. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I need to follow you. Well, look at it. The Bible says in verse 7, it's the perfect blood, the blood of Jesus, his son, which cleanses us from sin. You see, it's the perfect light of Christ that makes our dark spots obvious so that we have no excuse for our rejection of him. It is not his perfection, it's our rejection that's condemnation. Jesus says it. John chapter 3, he doesn't have to judge us. We've already judged ourselves. He came to save it. There's reception and understanding this. You see, God's perfect. And his relationship with us and our relationship with him is based on his perfection, not our deeds. Look at verse 8 through 10. The, the Bible goes on further. This is, this is big. This is amazing. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It's, all, it's always their fault. Anyone ever hear I have kids in this room? It's always their fault. Adam said it. It's the woman you gave me. It's what he said to the Lord in Genesis. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. This is, this is why so many New Year's resolutions fail. They're like the sower seeds. It's like we're just throwing things out in front of God and hoping they stick. We're not really trying. We're giving lip service to it. In other words, we're throwing our slots, our stuff before God and saying, God, you bless my actions. You give me the okay. You just say you'll walk with me through this. And I bet you'll be honored. I bet you'll be okay. What Jesus says is, you're deceiving yourself. You see, we live in a time that basically says this. If you don't recognize something as a sin, then it's not a sin. Smoking marijuana, is that a sin? Well, they just legalized it. Must not be a sin anymore. How'd that happen? Adultery was a sin, and then we changed the law. Now adultery is no longer prosecutable. Is that a sin? Who's making the rules? Who's making the law? The, the idea is, is that it's easy to live without sin as long as we don't recognize anything that we are doing as really bad sin. But, but the problem with this idea is that for you and I, as a, as a Christian, we are called to live in a time of rampant sin without sinning. Not to justify our sin. That's living defeated a victorious life. 
that's incompatible with God. It, it's intolerant of the Lord. It's tolerant of self-idolatry. You see, if we're going to live victoriously, then we have to embrace this reality that leaning into his perfection, the thing that scares us to death because of the darkness of our sin, is the only place victory is found. To confess the dark blemishes on our heart and not justify them. To lean into his perfection instead of creating a path to eventually he'll come around. God will forgive me today what I do tomorrow, what I do today. What happens if your life ends today, Jesus would say to the man who stores up treasures for himself. Church, this morning, I want you to understand that victory is already yours in the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to try to attain it anymore. That's the shift we need to take as a church. Here's the beauty. If you are draped in the blood of Jesus Christ, even the maintenance for legitimate fellowship with God is not based on who you are. It's found in Christ alone. Isn't that awesome? My, my daughter and I, we were having this conversation. Um, my, my car decided to blow up a little while ago on the side of the road next to the Astro Stadium. And, uh, and so it was done. Got a new car the other day, and I'm a gas mileage nut, so I'm playing games to see how many miles per gallon I, I can get in my car. If I had a Lamborghini, I'd be playing games to see how fast I could go because it's just good. And, and my daughter was talking, and we, she said, man, no matter how hard I try, when I start going, I'm always getting bad gas mileage. And I said, that, that's because to get the car going always takes more effort than keeping the car going. Amen? That's why we get great gas mileage from, from Houston, the other side, to Dallas. Like, there's nothing in the middle. Once you get build momentum, you just run it. See, there's a fallacy when it comes to understanding how maintaining legitimate fellowship works in a believer's life. A lot of times we think, God, you built the momentum. I've got it from here. You, you started this thing going. You started the change of events. You took care of the initial. The rest is on me. Father God, thank you for saving me. I'll show you that you made the right call by picking on me or some of us the other way God thanks for starting this ball rolling I know that you've got it so I'll go back to justifying my life with my own sin because you've got it all of those point to self idolatry here's the freedom the maintaining of a legitimate fellowship with God is not based on you it's based on him look in your Bible chapter 2 verse 1 through 4 then we'll kick it down a little further it says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Check that out. He's writing it so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with his Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sin, not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. And by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. For whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. You see, the maintaining of legitimate fellowship, it starts and ends in Jesus Christ. He says, I, I'm even telling you all of this not so that you will feel good when you sin. Your path is based on who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm showing you my character so that you might have victory when you're tempted to sin. But the beauty says is, if you do sin, now there's a, there's a key thing here. Over and over this passage of Scripture, you'll hear this. If you are clothed in the blood of, blood of Christ, we don't sin so that God's grace may increase. Scripture says that, Paul. We, we, don't, we don't sin knowing God will forgive me, it'll be okay. That's how we live unvictoriously when we've already tasted victory, when we've already been secured. But Jesus says, here's what I want you to know. If you sin, if temptation overwhelms you, if you sin... In other words, I know that you will. If you sin, 
you have an advocate. You see, the maintaining of your relationship with God, your fellowship with God, is understanding that he's your repairman when things break. That means when you are draped in victory and you don't live like you're draped in victory, that maintaining your relationship with God is based on his perfection. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says that we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. An advocate is literally a person. I wrote this down. It's literally a person who speaks in our favor or speaks favorably about you. He uses another big word here. It says that Jesus is the propitiation of our sin. In other words, he, through his life and his blood, settled account. That's why Paul says we should not choose to sin. Sin should always be, for a Christian, something that catches us off guard and causes us to repent quickly. Because our sin caused the death of our Savior. So why would I sin to appease me knowing that it harms my Lord? Do you see where victory starts working in here? Do you you see what happens when we start to understand, I get it, Lord. I want to follow after you. I want to run hard after you. That's victoriously living. If you're running hard and you trip and you get back up and you keep running, you're still running towards victory. Just stumbling around for the heck of it. That's not living in victory. That's being in the race and living like you're losing. But if you trip, if you stumble, when you sin, if you're clothed in the blood of Jesus Christ, he speaks favorably to you, of you, to the Lord our God. And he does it because his life has settled accounts once and for all. That's the great truth of why you don't have to clean up your life before accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because you're coming before God is not based on how clean and how good you you can get. It's based on Jesus Christ speaking favorably of you because he paid the penalty for your sin. That's the beauty. I think so many times we find ourselves tripped up on our walk with with faith or coming to know the Lord because we think, I can't receive Jesus into this filthy body. Guess what? It's the blood of Jesus that cleans this filthy body. It's not your deeds that draw him near. It's his perfection that draws you near. All of a sudden, we start to understand that there's nothing that we have to plead before the Lord. There's no list of things that we've done to show the Lord why we deserve Him or why we deserve an ongoing relationship. But instead, Jesus says, put your hand down, son. Dad, I took care of this. And when they stumble, I I died for that too. When they fall, don't worry, Dad. They're with us. They're mine. How freeing is that? How much easier it is for us to live in victory when the life that we live is not up to us to maintain that relationship with God. It's simply to lean into it, to respond to that relationship with Christ. Verse 5 through 11 unpacks this even more. Because we have to start wondering, then, then what are my actions? So what good is it? If Jesus does it all, What are my actions? How do you live a victorious life, pastor, if everything is about him? Verse 5 through 11. The Bible says this. Ah, I'll go first five in my Bible. I just lost it. Here it is. But whoever keeps his word is in him truly. In him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you that no new commandment, this is an old commandment, You've heard it from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is, the, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother, they're actually in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, 
And in him there's no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and, who, and does not know where he is going because darkness has still blinded his eyes. Here's the truth. Here's, here's what our actions show. The fruit born in my life is a witness to the authenticity of my fellowship with God. You see, I, I love how it starts off. It says, listen, if you're truly the Lord's, verse 6, chapter 2, if you abide in him, you ought to walk like him. Okay, if you're a parent in the room, have you noticed, whether you like it or not, your children have some similarities to you? They have that same walk. They carry their shoulders the same way. I, I, I've watched some of your children, right? They walk like you. If your chin's down, your kid's kind of always, are your chin's up, who's walking up, Right? You have a funny gait, they have a funny gait. Now you're wondering who I'm talking about. But catch it, right? Mannerisms, vocabularies. Where did you learn that word? Mm. Right? We, we know that our children bear the fruit of the authenticity, the depth of our relationship. Guess what? The works that we do when we bought, walk our way through trials, when we respond to victories, when we give glory or when we take it, they don't make us more the Lord's or not the Lord's. They open our eyes to the depth and authenticity of our true relationship or our true spiritual standing or our immaturity or our maturity with the Lord at that moment. This is not a new word. This is an old word. Verse 7, an old commandment that I have from the beginning that the word is the word that you have heard. Since the beginning, your actions never saved you and they never brought you closer to God your actions bore out your proximity to God if sin is driving your heart right now that sin doesn't push you from God that sin that you live out is revealing where you really are with God if if out of your life I mean Eric gave a great testimony this morning you're, you're sitting out and you're saying God where did that come from God's just saying, I just want to let you know right now, right here with me. This is where we are. You're welcome. I mean, we, we take these inventories. Have you ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory, a personality inventory? If you ever take a spiritual gifts inventory as a Christian or a personality inventory, and, and it opens up the page, and you're surprised, then the test is weird. It's wrong. You took it incorrectly. Because 99 times out of 100, when you take one of those inventories, it's simply to show you who you are on the outside. Right? If I took a spiritual or, a, or personality test inventory right now, and I said, here are my results, and it showed that I was a recluse, introverted, non-talkative, angry at people kind of person, what would you think? Wow, I never knew that, Pastor. You think, Pastor, I think you made a mistake. Because this should just show you what's already happening in me. What the Bible says is how we walk, the decisions that we glean and cling to, the actions that we make will not push you closer or pull you further from God. They simply reveal what you have embraced where you are. And that fruit should lead us healthy fruit into praising God. Lord, how do I get more? The fruit of sin should lead us to repentance. Maybe it should show us that we're out of fellowship and we need to be in fellowship that we might turn and plead grace and mercy. That's what your actions and my actions this year should do. They should show us the fruit of our relationship with God. They are not markers on how you're getting closer or how you can obtain a closer relationship with God. That's unbiblical. 
What does that mean? It means that your actions aren't judged. Check it out. Your heart has already proven before an action is ever made. It's what Jesus says to the Pharisees. It's not about adultery. You looked at a woman adulterously. I know where your heart is before your body acts. Your actions don't make you closer. It reveals your distance. Church, this morning, we need to understand that the fruit in our life that we're bearing needs to be a witness to our authenticity and our relationship with God. In church, this year, to live victoriously, you let your fruit be a marker, a witness to you of how you are leaning into your relationship with God, how you are embracing the clothing, the garment of the God of light over you. You see, church, because we're already living in victory. This year, our, our job is not to bear fruit that pleases God. Our, our charge is to live victoriously this year because Jesus has already provided the victory he's already provided the way out he's already provided the way home he's already made it possible for you to bear fruit the spiritual fruit that God gives to us it's meant to be consumed if you bear the fruit of love who should be the first person to eat from it you should you should be delighted by that love. And it should call you to want more. Peace, patience, kindness. I don't bear the fruit of peace to just throw it out and to be wasted. I can't give you peace. I'm not that prince. God bears fruit in your life as a witness, as a testimony to others. But as a treat to his child. My prayer is that we bear fruit this year to show that God is perfection, has drawn us near. You see, you're already living in victory if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't, you're not. But if you already have been clothed in the blood of Jesus Christ, I, I encourage you, don't live this year like you've been defeated. From the day you knew Jesus, Lord and Savior, you've been a victor. Our defeat only happens because we feel like we haven't had enough victory. Listen to what the Bible says if that's where you are. Verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because, it's already happened, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because, it's already happened, you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because, it's already happened, you have overcome the evil one. They're not in heaven. They're still struggling. They're still going to trip. They're still going to fall. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. Not you will be strong. Not you can be strong. Because your strength isn't based on your perfection or how you're handling a situation. It's based on his. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you because Jesus is the word. And you have already done overcome the evil one. Church. You want to live victoriously this year? You celebrate the victory that God has given you and you live in His already done. This year, you will be faced with trials and tribulations. You'll be faced with difficult decisions and hard times and angry thoughts and you're going to trip. That's okay. Don't plan on it. That's different. But if you trip, don't run away. His perfection is made way. You have an advocate. Stand up. I've already taken care of that. Yeah. God, I feel so far from you. Well, if you feel far and you're bearing that fruit, it's because you are. But my perfection has found you out. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation right here, right now. So, what are you going to do? 
Are you going to live in victory now that we've got that behind us? Or are you going to live in defeat even though I've already had victory? Church, here's the truth. In Jesus Christ, his perfection, no darkness, provides everything you need today and for forevermore. Everything. I'm afraid the church is dying. I mean all over our country. Because we have forgotten that in the most dire and difficult times that we're still living in victory. And that there's no default plan. And so, with the best intentions, we come up with a plan that we know is not of the Lord, and we ask Him to bless it eventually. That's how children think when they say it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. My prayer is that we would be better because He has already made us better that this year that you and I would lay all that we have squarely before the Lord and let his perfection have his way in us and that we just drink it in and let it soak deeply and that we live a life that shows that he is maturing me. That's my prayer for this year. Let's pray together. Father God, I, 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 I can't even understand why I have a hard time knowing that I live in a completed victory and still making a resolution to live a victorious life every year. <laughs> All I can say is that shows the fruit of where I need to draw near to you or where you're drawing me near to you. So Lord, today, I pray for our church and for your church here and all over, God, that we would understand that we're already strong, that we've already overcome, that we already have the word in us, that we already know you. Lord Jesus, and that we might be a church who lives victoriously no matter how difficult or how wonderful the season is because our victory is not based on any of that anyway. Lord God, there's some in this room today that thinks that their relationship with you can't happen until they have a few victories on their own. Till they victoriously understand five or six different points. Till they victoriously clean up or overcome this ailment that's with them. Father God, right now, would you set them free? And let them understand that it is your perfection that makes them perfection, that makes them perfect. And that they have sinned. And all they have to do is confess their sin before you and receive the hand of the advocate, Jesus Christ, who gave his life to pay off the penalty of their sin. Lord, would you let them know that life has already been provided in your perfection? We come to you today, Jesus, in your name.